Hello and welcome. Very pleased you could be with us tonight. I'm talking with the Minnesota leader, not Minnesota born, but now a Minnesotan. Daniel Wordsworth is with me. He is the president and CEO of the American Refugee Committee, which is based here in Minneapolis. It's the largest humanitarian relief organization in the Midwest mm -hmm. and one of the top ones in the world. So welcome, Daniel. Good, thank you, Mary. To Great our to be show. Here. Um, I'd like to start out talking some about your early life from Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, you've come and, and then we'll shift and talk some about the refugee crisis because I've been so aware lately and, and uh, the last many years, but we have more people on the move in our world now proportionately than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a hard, hard time. Yeah. Well, you grew up on a farm mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know what kind of a farm it was, except I know your father wanted to develop the world's best children's pony. Oh, you've done your research, yes. He wanted <laughs> to develop the uh, world's most perfect child's pony, yes. yes. So he used to breed Arabian horses, and he, his idea was to blend the, um, an Arabian mare with a stallion that came from the Welsh mining tradition. So it's like a little right. a, a miniature horse. And so the idea was to shrink the Arab horse down into the sort of a, a beautiful but small kind of pony. In and fact, was he successful? Finally, after I think about 10 years, up until that time he managed to breed in the worst characteristics of both <laughs> horses. But finally at the end he did breed a beautiful, lovely little horse called Amigo and when he did that he said, that's it, it's all over, uh -huh. no more. But he was actually a businessman, so the farm we lived on... The sort of a really citizen's farm, huh? Kind of like mm -hmm. that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and you went to school in Australia mm -hmm. at Deakins University? Yes. What kind of a, a, a university is it? What does it specialize oh, well, in? Well, Deakin is a university much like um, any, any large sort of state-run institution, so okay. it does many courses. What I was studying was uh, international development and uh, community development studies, and at the time that was in the 90s, that was quite a new field. I bet, and you got yeah. your master's work done there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and then you had kind of a, I don't know, epiphany is the right word, but you had a, a real sense of um, change of direction as a very young man, right? Can you, mm -hmm. can you describe that? You were on a ship, I read, uh, as part of your Navy um, I was in the Royal experience. Australian Navy, yes, and I was on a ship, and I, I, I think I just decided that I wanted to... Um, Help poor people, yeah. And that's that's not something the average young Navy man comes to a, a conclusion about. Mm -hmm. What do you think was sort of behind that? Was it influence from relatives, from parents, um, reading? Uh, you said you weren't particularly religious, mm. or aren't? Is that that's true? Correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what what kind of do you think? Which pushed everything together to come to that conclusion. It's, it's mm. very interesting. Yeah, I've, I've thought back on that. At the time, I, I don't think I was conscious of anything really driving me. Um, I came from a background, I had a great dad, and I grew up in a farm, and so I was used to a community that looked after each other, and so I had all of those mm. things, but I certainly, I don't think, prepared for the kind of life that I'm doing now. Uh, I, I'm not sure that it wasn't just perspective. I think mm -hmm. I just realized that um, in life, in the end, the most important things are other human beings, and so a life spent serving them is a life well spent. And it probably sounds more noble than it was at the time. Mm -hmm. At the time, it just seemed to be the most obvious thing to do. So I was inspired by actually a religious text early in the piece, which is the Beatitudes. You know, if you have two shirts, you should give one. If somebody strikes you on the cheek, you should turn the other. So I was struck by that, but it didn't come out of it. I wasn't, wasn't based on a church experience. I just read it mm -hmm. and just thought it struck me that it was a, seemed like a good thing to do. And that is the age that often people are idealistic and um, dreamers, right. but don't always stick with it, and, and that's maybe a big difference between yeah. you and a lot of 21-year-olds. Um, 
I read that you, you rounded up some friends and started a homeless center right. in a big old house. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. that sounded pretty, uh, pretty high risk oriented in terms of how you ran it. And, but well, it reinforced your, your sense of mission, I bet. Hmm? Certainly, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do think actually you don't, your idealism doesn't have to decrease with age. No, you know? no. It and I, I know you certainly don't feel that way, but I, I really embrace that idea. Actually, I'm almost exactly the same person as I was 20 years ago. Hopefully I'm a little bit wiser, uh -huh, yeah? Uh -huh. But essentially my ideals have stayed exactly the same over that time. And so I, I, we did start in Sydney and we did work uh, with uh, folks that were disadvantaged. So I did get a group of um, friends together. We did rent a large house. We did send letters around to uh, crisis centers, uh, places that work with kids on the street, prison halfway houses, and we did say, if you have anyone that's too wild for you, anyone that um, you can't take, if you're full and you've got overflowing people, send them our way, we take everybody that comes. And so we did that for a few years. So you had heroin users, you had just plain homeless people, it yeah. must have been. I didn't know this was written anywhere, I don't know. <laughs> well, I did some, some reading, and yes, it's, it's um... Yes, we had a whole mixture of folks that lived in that house. It was one of the great experiences of my, uh, of my uh -huh. life, actually, yeah. Um, as a social worker by training and doing some yet, I talk with a lot of people in the helping professions, yeah. and one of the things that seems to happen to a lot of people is burnout, mm -hmm. but it sounds like you've always kind of looked at the, the jobs you've taken on um, with the Christian Children's Fund where you became a vice president and um, your work certainly now. You've looked at it in a realistic way that hasn't been putting you under pressure, it sounds like, to do things more than uh, are possible. Am I, am I stating it correctly? Um, when I, I, I try to think about this, and I, I, I don't know actually that I have the answer to this, and maybe it is um, this idea of perspective, right? So that's what I thought I, I think I had 20 years ago, was the realization mm -hmm. that at the end of your life, you're going to look back on that life, and you're going to have to judge for yourself whether you lived a life that was worthy of you and worthy of your neighbors and your community. Mm -hmm. And, and that's not a burden to me, actually. It's never really been a burden. I don't feel like I have to solve all the world's problems, but I do See, feel like I have to do what I can do. Yeah. See, yeah. I think that's a key in my mm -hmm. sense of understanding you. You don't feel you have to do everything. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you don't go home at the end of the day feeling like, oh my gosh, I didn't do, I didn't do, but more, I did do, I did do. Yeah, and what you realize over time, and I think this is one of the differences when you're in this kind of work versus looking at it from the outside, is that when you're looking at it from the outside, what you mostly see is the really negative stuff. Right, yeah? right. So you see like a crisis in Syria or the situation in Somalia. You see conflict, you see people suffering, and that seems to be the dominant story. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at it from my point of view, Actually, what you see are like teams of amazing people that are stepping up and actually wanting to do something to make a difference, right? You're seeing people that in many ways um, have no connection to a country like Sudan that still say, I want to do something about that. When you see a thing like the Ebola crisis in Liberia and you think, who would be crazy enough to go over there and respond, right? So when we advertised for our Ebola treatment unit in Liberia, we had so many applications that we had to shut down our mm, website because really? so many people applied within the wow. first two days. Wow, yeah. so you, you get inspired by the people who come to you saying, we want to help. I get completely inspired mm -hmm. by them and, and that's why I, I, it's true that I'm not alone in this. It's true that none of us are. It's actually mm -hmm. true that you're surrounded by people of goodwill that want to mm -hmm. make a difference. Actually, even when you visit camps, and you see people at the extremity, what you see are really determined, amazing people trying to look mm -hmm. after their families. Mm -hmm. It's mostly, and I don't want to sound glib about this or naive, because I'm certainly not either of those mm -hmm. things, but humanity becomes larger the more you work with it, not smaller or meaner. Yeah? And so That's I don't find it that quote. hard. Mm. 
So you're looking at resilience instead of hopelessness. I'm experience, experiencing resilience. Yeah. I get to see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so whilst I think you do have to look at a situation in a very sort of hard way, in a realistic way, and realize this is a very tough environment and mm -hmm. it's really tough on the people that are experiencing it, it's not, it's just, it's just not, it's not overwhelming in that way. And I think what's hard for people to see sometimes that you do, there is literally an army of people that want to do good, mm -hmm. yeah? And the army of people that want to do good is far larger than these small bands of people that want to do bad, yeah? And the more you live in that environment, the more mm -hmm. you see it. Mm -hmm. When you're in a city like, um, say, Port-au-Prince, after an earthquake, you see people from all over the world there. Mm -hmm. Chinese search and rescue workers, mm -hmm. Japanese um, nurses, uh, Israeli doctors. You see mm -hmm. um, uh, French teams on the ground trying to help rebuilding. You, you get this sort of feeling. It's um, really quite remarkable. And I do, th I do think, yes, part of this is maintaining a positive narrative for yourself, not getting mm -hmm. caught up in your own head. Mm -hmm. But it's not that hard. Well, I, I love, love your thinking. You have been the head, uh, the president, CEO of ARC since 2009. Um, describe the organization just for those who don't know much at all about it. Mm -hmm. Because, as I said, it's one of the leading relief organizations in the country and in the world. But I don't think everyone in Minneapolis and St. Right. Paul has a good handle on it. Mm -hmm. So we're very proud to be based here in Minnesota and we've been in the Twin Cities for over 35 years now and we call this our home. This is uh, you know, where we're from. We have lived through all the winters that other folks here in the Twin <laughs> Cities have. A now, survivor. We're, we're a survivor. <laughs> now we have hundreds of staff around the world that work from many different countries and are from those countries themselves, but we still feel that our roots are here in Minnesota. As an organization, what we do is we focus on people and those countries that are experiencing, I think, the, f the sort of front line of suffering. So we focus on countries that are experiencing conflict or have just emerged out of conflict. They've experienced large-scale uh, disaster. Some people call these fragile states. Mm -hmm. yep. So we work in places like Congo or Somalia or Sudan. We don't work in places like Tanzania or India. Or Ethiopia. And you have about 12 countries you are focusing on. Why don't, let's, let's name them if, we, if you would. Right. So I've got to hope I get <laughs> this all This is the 12, test here, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> so we work, I'll, I'm just going to go across. Okay. Yep. So starting in Lake, so we work Asia, in Liberia. Africa. No, we'll, I'll start in oh, Africa okay. from West Africa okay. and move my way across. That's probably betraying my Australian um, century <laughs> yes. view in the world. Yeah. <laughs> So um, starting in, we work in Liberia, we work in the Sudan, we work in South Sudan, we work in Somalia, we work in Uganda, we work in Rwanda, we work in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We also work in Syria and Jordan in the Middle East. In Asia, we work in Pakistan and in Thailand and in Myanmar. So, so I'm hoping that's the 12. Seven of the 12 are in Africa, right? right. Um, do you, well, how many people are out there as volunteers primarily, um, and how many are staff in these 12 countries? So the vast majority of people that we have working for us are staff. So we have around one and a half thousand staff around the world that work in these countries. One and a half thousand paid staff. One and a half thousand, mm -hmm. okay. Yep. 1,500. 1,500, yeah. yep. And they are people like uh, water engineers or doctors, mm -hmm. nurses. They could be psychosocial social workers uh, like you were. They may also be finance teams and administrative folks and logisticians. The vast majority of those are actually from the countries themselves. So inside of mm -hmm. Somalia, most of our staff are Somali. In Sudan, they're Sudanese. So they're from those countries. We have around 40 to 50 what we call international staff. So they're folks that don't come from the country that they're working in. But many of those are from countries nearby. The person that leads our Congo program is, is from Guinea in West Africa, for example. Mm -hmm. And here in the Twin Cities, we have 
45 staff that work for us. Okay, and your budget is 28 million roughly? No, it's just almost 50 million. Oh, it's, uh, last oh, it's year. gone up a lot then since you've been here. Yeah. Yes, I, I guess I was reading some old, old numbers. That's one of your big jobs, I'm sure, fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, is that onerous for you or, or do you? I love it. You love it, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fundraising is not easy, I, I, I think. Yeah, because it's not. It takes a, a certain kind of person. What the, the way we view um, the American Refugee Committee is, is it kind of does two things, yeah? which is a part of it is the obvious thing, is we work with people that are affected by conflict. So we work with mm -hmm. folks in Mogadishu or in um, Darfur in the Sudan or in a mm -hmm. refugee settlement in Uganda. That's a big part of what we do. But the other part of what we do is provide a platform, if you like, or a pathway for everyday people, whether they live in Minnesota or whether they live in Washington or whether they live anywhere actually in the world, we allow those people to connect to those refugees and make a difference. And so we actually see the American Refugee Committee as a bit like a servant to the idealism of everyday people. Kind of a conduit? Well, just a, sort of, a, it's, why, do, why does a nonprofit exist? At its base, every nonprofit was started by one, two, or three people mm -hmm. that looked at something and said, you know what, the world should not be like this. Mm -hmm. We're going to step up and make a difference. Mm -hmm. And they just create an organization to do that. But all the organization does is it just represents an organizational form. It is simply the expression of the idealism of its founders. And after that moment, it picks up people around mm -hmm. cities and communities mm -hmm. that say, you know what, I care about refugees, I care about people affected by conflict, and I want to do something about it. And so when I think about fundraising, I, I just see that as me and our organization giving folks a chance to make a difference. I think it's a great thing, I love doing it. One of my questions I'm going to skip because it was, what makes a good nonprofit leader? But I think everything you've shared to this point, Daniel, explains why you're a great great uh, nonprofit leader. Um, one of the things you said in one of the articles I read is that climate change is going to have a profound effect on our refugee situation in the next 15, 10, 15 years. Um, does it scare you a lot? Scare me. Um. It's a, it's a major concern, yes, mm -hmm. whether it's environmental degradation, rising sea levels, sort of movements mm -hmm. of rural populations forced into economic migration, those kinds of things are a huge concern. Mm -hmm. And you're already seeing this huge number of people just this year that have been forced to move from their homes right. and really the, the world is struggling actually to care for those people. Right. And so, and that right now it's sitting at around 60 million people. And I, I'm always a little bit nervous about saying that because it's sort of a mind-blowing number, like what does 60 million people kind mean? It overwhelms. It's, it's a huge number. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, heaven forbid if it gets much worse. So, yes, it's a worry. And with rising sea levels, a lot of vulnerable countries are going to, you know, people will be forced to flee. We have places like Bangladesh where that will have a big mm -hmm. impact, yes. Mm -hmm. Not just the island states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of the countries that are taking refugees, I was in Italy this spring and uh, felt the resistance of, of citizens to mm. influx of people and we're reading about Turkey and we're reading about Hungary and a lot of countries are saying, no, 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 we can't handle more. Um, what can we do here to help shift that kind of, don't come to my country, is there anything as a leader that you think of that you can do or that citizens can do to kind of reframe how we think um, as world citizens? Mm. I think I'd say two things to this. Um, one is that often we make the story about the refugee a story about ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, each year the U.S. takes about 70,000 refugees. And as an Australian, I'm also acutely aware that right now Australia is performing very disgracefully when I it comes mean. to this very issue. Yep. So I'm certainly not the one 
to stand there and lecture anybody in the US about this. And the US has a rich history, actually, of helping people from around the world. But We're doing I, quite a lot with aid. Are doing a huge amount. USAID yeah. uh, yeah. is doing a huge amount over mm -hmm. here, actually. It was the leadership of the Obama administration that I think was a key part of stopping the Ebola outbreak in um, mm -hmm. West Africa. So the US is doing amazing stuff mm -hmm. around the world. But I would make this point. 90% of the world's refugees come live in countries that are either poorer or, or as right. poor as the country right. they left. Right. The world's refugees don't live in Italy or Hungary mm -hmm. or the United States or Australia. They live in Rwanda, Chad, Cameroon, mm -hmm. Kenya. Mm -hmm. That's where they live. So they're going from a tough place to another tough, tough place. place. And it's those countries that mm -hmm. are absorbing, you mentioned Turkey. Turkey mm -hmm. has absorbed 1.3 million people because of the Syrian crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, the other neighboring country, Lebanon, has taken in 1.1 million people. Oh, I didn't know the that. The country of Jordan has taken in 670,000 people from Syria. Most of those actually living in people's homes. Mm. The majority, three quarters mm. of the refugees that have come from Syria into Jordan actually live in the homes of Jordanian people. That is a statistic I've heard. It's really quite heard. remarkable. That is. And so I think I mean, my, that's one of those positive things that... It's one of those remarkable yeah. things, yeah. yes. Now, I would say it's not, again, we could rejoice. I mean, you, you can see the nature of humanity. But this is a huge burden on Jordan. Yes, yeah? yes. But, but this is really where the world's refugees go. They're placing an intolerable burden on people that are really already having trouble. In a place like South Sudan, half a million people have been displaced because of the conflict there. But over the same period, two and a half million went in. Yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, 250,000 went in, 500,000 went out. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, my, my... No, no, no. So That's in South clear. Sudan, 500,000 left. Right. But 250,000 have fled other countries in right, to South right. Sudan. And the other point that I would say is that in the end, we're human beings, and these are human beings. Mm -hmm. And each and one of us. half of them are children. Yeah, about that's half. What, mm -hmm. That's what really hit me as I was thinking hard about this. Yeah. Half of them are kids. And if they don't have a, a decent experience growing up, we're going to have a lot of trouble with very unhappy, restless. Well, I think the average old. lifespan in a refugee camp is around 15 years. The so, average lifespan, in so other words. So meaning if you walk, the day after you walk into a refugee camp, and it's typically about 15 years later when you walk no, out. Okay. Is it 15 And so if you're a years? child, you've lived you your childhood, your youth, and your university yeah. years in the, that I camp. I didn't realize it was that long. I. I think I had read something that was, was you know, much shorter, but 15 years in a camp. Depends a little bit on the region, but sure, it's between 12 sure. to 17 years. Mm -hmm. And I also read that a huge percent of, percentage though, of refugees aren't in camps. No. They don't have camps to go to. The camps are full. Yes. So that's a whole other issue. So how do you keep from feeling overwhelmed, I guess, just thinking about the good things going on? No, no, because, well, I mean, you reflect on those positive things, and I, and I would say we get to experience them. So it's not like I'm sitting in my office, you know, chain smoking and trying to think, you know, happy thoughts. <laughs> I actually get to live these things. I was just in a refugee camp only a few weeks ago, and I actually mm -hmm. get to be with people, mm -hmm. and I get to watch our team working with mm -hmm. them, and I get to talk with refugees. So there, there I have that, yeah. And I do think, and it, it's one of the great things about having the doing the work that I do and the team of ARC does is we get to do things. Mm -hmm. So it's not and like we are powerless is, in the yes, face of yes. these things. Yep, I you understand. get to actually go and set up a hospital, right. set up a refugee camp. We feel like we're making a difference. And you are, you are. But yes, you're right. Action really is so key, isn't it, mm. to, to not feeling depressed. Um, I'm getting the signal we want to give a a website address for your great organization. Um, if you want to learn more and read about the work they're doing in individual countries, read more about their mission, more about Daniel, go to www.arcrelief.org. Well, I didn't hear your answer to what we can do as individuals to keep from 
um, uh, saying, no, don't come to our country. I mean, do we need to say to our leaders, we want to take more people in to equalize things out? Mm. I, I always feel a little bit sort of, uh, what I, w I would say to people is this, that every generation that has lived for the last few generations has dealt with big things. True. Big things around the world. Mm -hmm. And yet every generation, the good people of those generations stand up and say, in the face of this, I'm going to act. I'm going to bring up my family, do all the things I normally do, but I'm also going to be a good person and respond. So I'd ask people just to have empathy and to mm -hmm. look at themselves and ask, what can I do? Mm -hmm. And part of that could be, if you know some politicians, you could always say, this is a good thing and I support this. But the city of, uh, the Twin Cities have been great at this, and Minnesota is one of the great refugee receiving states in the US, so I think we should be proud of ourselves. Mm -hmm. we, we have, uh, isn't it the largest Somali right. um, group in the country, yes. and, and Hmong too? I, I'm not sure if it's the largest, but it's but a very it's large, one of the great big community. Ones, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming down and um, sharing your inspiring thoughts and, and feelings. And um, I hope you plan to stay on as lead man at ART indefinitely. Is that something we can, can hope for? I, I, it's up to my board, but I'm very happy there. Oh, good. Good. That's great. Well, thank you so thank much. You. And good thank luck you. to you with your great work. I've been talking with Daniel Wordsworth, who is the president and CEO of the American Refugee Committee. Go to the website to learn more about the wonderful work they're doing, um, working really a lot in the medical world, working with uh, AIDS and uh, HIV prevention, et cetera. So thank you again, and thank you. I'll be back next week. Until then, have a good week. <laughs>